Hey everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Now today, as you can see, we are continuing on with Brent Christensen, and we are going to be looking at part two of day four. So as you saw from the last video, they split the day up, and it actually took them a little bit to put part four out, and so I'm recording it. So that's why everything looks different. Anyways, go ahead, get your place on the sofa, get something to drink, get something to eat, and let's jump into it. The first person we're going to be looking at their testimony of is Eric Stiverson, and he was a detective with the University of Illinois Police Department. He got a call in about the missing scholar from a supervisor and began working on the case. And so one of the biggest things that I want to talk about with his testimony is the interview they, they did. And they do show, they, you can go and if you Google this, you can see the full interview online. Uh, it is very interesting. And uh, when the clip starts playing at one point, Stiverson says, Look, you know we didn't call you up here to talk about video games and what you had for lunch that day. Now, Christensen acknowledged that they were talking to him because the car I own was seen picking up the girl that's missing. Why, yes, Christensen, that's why we're here. Very good guess. Stiverson testifies that at this point he didn't know Christensen had been looking up updates about Zong. So, you know, some of the stuff, again, we're looking at all this like after the fact or whatever. So he didn't know this at that point. Um, but then the conversation kind of steers towards the surveillance video that they have. And Christensen says, I've seen the car, but I didn't see me. Oh, okay, well, you can just go on home. Sorry we bothered you. You know what I mean? Like, it's, again, it's just for somebody who's so big and bad murderer, you know. Anyways, let's keep going. You've seen what we've allowed you to see, Stiverson tells him. I love that. You've only seen what we let you see, boy. Can I see the stuff that you're talking about then? Christensen asked. Well, sure, here's all the evidence we have, sir. Could we get you something to go with that? Fries, possibly? Do you, think we, do you think we brought you up here to watch videos, son? He doesn't call him son, but I wish it, I could totally see him doing that. Uh, Stiverson testifies that Christensen was trembling and looking down at the table between him and Managanaro. Uh, and Christensen in the video reiterates that Zong was speaking very broken English. Uh, after the part of video when Stiverson insists that Christensen is lying to them, uh, he tells the court that his voice began to tremble, and his eyes were darting back and forth, and that by the end of the interview, I guess Christensen normally has kind of pale skin, he had broken out in what looked like hives with red blotches all over him. So, I mean, he's completely melting down. And again, this is a guy that's bragging about this, bragging about what a you know big-time, big-shot murderer he is, and this is the reality of it. The, a, a coward. You know, a coward that has taken an innocent person's life. The defense, it's, that's essentially the most stuff that here that I want to speak about it. Uh, the defense did not cross-examine him. Now, again, y'all, the defense takes, and, and y'all, we're looking at the notes here, but it shocks me how much the defense does not cross-examine these people. And, I mean, maybe behind the scenes, they're like, look, you already know you're going to jail for the rest of your life. That's not a question. You know, so best to be quiet about some things. You know what I'm saying? Please hold. Mm. So good. Okay, so the next person, I'm going to butcher the name, but we're going to try, is Brian Schickelberg. Let's call him Brian. So he's a special agent with the FBI, and he partnered with Sergeant, with Special Agent Andrew Hugstadt uh, during kind of like the beginning parts of the investigation. And they talked to, you know, he was helping look for the Astro and things of that nature. You know, he goes into their search for it, how they identified it by the hubcap again. If you're gonna do crimes using a car, do not have glaringly obvious things wrong with the car that will bring it back to you. 101 there. So after that, so once Christensen's Asher was seized, he says that uh, he was the photographer for the search of his apartment. 
And after that, he says that he and Huckstat went to talk to Tara Bullis. Remember, that's the girlfriend. And she cooperated and agreed to wear a recording device during the their second interview with her. So that's very... So we're kind of connecting the dots here to how everything happened. Because remember, Tara is his girlfriend. She wore the recording device, and she got some major evidence on him. So, and it's showing here. I'll try and put these up here for you. Uh, they also searched her phone. They got copies of her messages. God, I would love to read those. Okay, so then they, they go into Brian uh, Shekelberg talks about the second interview uh, with Christensen that when he volunteered to go in. And essentially he's saying that they weren't going to try and challenge anything. They just wanted him to tell his side of the story. So I think this is a good move because they're sitting here allowing him to just dig a hole. You know, essentially. At this point, they know that this guy is lying. They're connecting the dots. I mean, they're honing in on him. So they're just going to basically be like, here's a shovel. Here's a bunch of dirt. It's actually very loose dirt. It's not compacted at all. Uh, go ahead and just start digging. And that's exactly what's going to happen. So... They talk about the ride along they went with him, trying to recall the route that he just mysteriously can't remember. Uh, he confirmed that there's no blood from the Astra. So, I mean, one thing I'm curious about that we haven't heard, and I mean, I guess we're not going to ever know, except, you know, him and unfortunately uh, Ying Ying, is what happened in the car? Because somehow he restrained her, something in the car, to get her to his apartment. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I, I'm so curious how he did that and driving and keeping her calm and the whole nine yards. That's about it for that testimony. And again, but um, bum the defense did not uh, question him. So the next person up is December Melville. I love that name, December. That's so pretty. Probably because it's my favorite month. Uh, now she says that she's a crime scene investigator with the Illinois State Police. And she was in there during the search of Christensen's apartment, and they were looking for everything pertaining to Ying Ying Zong, obviously her belongings, DNA, all that type stuff. Uh, they, she said it took about five to six hours to process the apartment. And I'm going to be posting the pictures of the apartment up here so y'all can see them. For me, and in fact, I'm just going to kind of commentary a little bit here while we show these pictures. Uh, the, the pictures are just spooky because you know what took place in here. So, and again, looking at the way the uh, complex is, I'm like, how did he pull this off getting her in there? I mean, it just blows my mind. So, but we see the layout here of the, uh, of the apartment. And let's see. So now Melville testifies that they used a spray compound, uh, basically luminol is what it was, that causes, bi causes biological evidence to glow. And more pictures show the Christensen's vacuum cleaner container was empty. The contents were found in the trash. Again, if you're going to do a crime or whatever, go ahead. And we don't know if they got anything out. We'll probably know here in a few minutes. Go ahead and just, you know... Get rid of all your garbage. Just do it. Just do it. And, and be careful where you do it. Don't, Mr. Dulos, who goes on video camera throwing bloody stuff away. I mean, these people, and again, thank God they do these things because it leads us back to them. But it just fascinates me how messy they get. So, anyways, back to the pictures. The government shows the pictures of cleaning products on the table, gloves and tools, an empty bottle of Drano. Uh, a knife was found on the utility floor. And, and so, you know, I'm just going to put these pictures up here. I just can't imagine what took place in there. I, I just just I can't imagine this poor young lady and, and then the bedroom here I mean it's just you know they show the restraints like the kind of uh, the leather gear or whatever uh, the baseball bat the vacuum cleaner American Psycho the, the you know the cleaning stuff the the garbage in there I mean the whole nine yards so I mean y'all just take a look at those uh, not in the bedroom there's a baseball bat black restraints Melville says she didn't find a gag though uh, the twin mattresses are pushed together and covered by a single black sheet. Black pirate flag hanging in the back. Uh, now, Melville says the CSI took swabs of the baseball bat, which indicated the potential for blood based on the luminol spray. Uh, prosecutors show the actual bat to the jury, and that's always spooky. I mean, just like when we, they were in um, uh, with uh, Tim Jones Jr. trial, when the prosecutor was doing that thing with the bell to show how he choked the children. It's just, you know, it just... When they bring the murder weapons and do things like that, it makes it that much realer for the jury. Uh, so they, they just go into talking about how uh, the mattresses and the stains they found on the mattress, and they swabbed each of them. 
Uh, Melville says that they see several items, uh, clothing, towels, keys, hair clippings, plastic gloves, men's shoes, a copy of Christensen's resume, a baseball bat, uh, you name it. Uh, the pro the defender did the public the federal defender did cross examine and Melville testifies that there are several things that can make luminol light up such as certain cleaning supplies. Now, if you've been following this with me, you know some of the stuff like in his car luminol reactive, but it was like to a bunch of cleaning stuff. So I guess my question, and we might find this out along the way, is is there cleaning stuff that you can literally clean so much that the blood is gone, but then it's going to obviously show, but well, there's tons of bleach in here or whatever. Um, and now, so uh, as an example with this situation, Melville says they tested the utility room and it turned out to be a false positive. So, you know, again, it's just at this point, they know that she was there or whatever, but it's trying to piece together what, what happened because I think that he's making it out to be something way more, um, than it was. And I mean, I guess you could say more graphic. Like at this point, I don't a hundred percent believe a lot of the stuff he's saying, obviously, Okay, now another witness that came up was Timothy, L Timothy Lamasters and another crime scene investigator. He spent three hours searching Ying Ying Zong's apartment, and they showed several photographs of this. They didn't list any right here. Um, and that's basically all uh, the defender, the federal defender gets up and cross examine him, asking about the luminol on the bat. And Lamasters agrees that anything detected technically has to go to the lab before it can be deemed blood. Uh, and Pollock makes sure that at that point, if someone only showers, there wouldn't be prints on the edge of the bathtub. And then court recesses for the day. So we're going to go ahead and wrap that kind of stuff up there. So again, as you see now, if I don't know if you're following me or not, but um, this they're talking like when they gave their preliminary schedule that this could be wrapping up this week and sending the jury out for deliberations. So to me, this is a very short trial. Uh, he is at this point admitting like, hey, I did this. And so I, I think he's just trying to save himself from the death penalty. But one thing that I just find even more, I mean, obviously he's a heinous person for doing this, but also what makes it heinous is the fact that he um, is not telling where she is. And number two, I, I think that he over exaggerates everything. And so it's very hard to believe you know, uh, like he's trying to make it out like it was this huge crime scene and he did all these awful, awful things to her. And I'm just like, well, let's see the evidence because, you know, I mean, I just, I don't, I think this guy's a coward. I mean, I just think he is. And I think that he gets off on other people's misery, obviously. And I think he also gets off on making it sound like he's way more horrific than he truly is. You know what I mean? Or capable of monstrous things than he really is. Uh, and I'm trying to, I'm not trying to say he's not a monster, but he's just trying to make himself sound cooler if that makes sense so i don't know i don't know uh I, I don't want to try and get into his head too much anyways so i'm gonna continue on and uh, we're gonna come out with the next video maybe later today i don't know we'll see uh for anybody that was in the live chat for our book club last, last night wednesday y'all that was so much fun uh, it's such a blast. Thank you to everyone for being there. Thank you, Owen, for talking. That was just amazing. So insightful. We have such a wonderful Sofa Squad here. So I invite you all to join. Anything you want to. We have lots of social media. Uh, Discord, Patreon, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You name it. The links are in the description. Uh, and I will talk to you all soon. Thank you and bye.